I'm a big believer in the power of mindset. There's a huge amount of research now showing that our mindsets can create self-fulfilling prophecies. Now that can, it can change things like our physiology, our perception, our behavior, our capacity to deal with failure, our motivation. It's kind of influencing our capacity for success in life, however we define that. I'm not saying that mindset is everything. Like we know that, you know, there are some, you know, limits to what mindset can do, but it really, I see it more as being like, um, by changing your mindset, you're kind of releasing the brakes on your potential. So if you have the right mindset, it can kind of accelerate your progress in whichever direction you want to go on. If you have a negative mindset, it can, you know, hold you back. It makes everything a lot harder. You're putting in a lot of work, but you're not really achieving what you want. David, I'm super excited to have you here today. Uh, me too. Yeah, thanks so much. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. So we're going to talk science, and I want to get into the, the meat of it. Uh, when we talk about mindset, we talk about mindset all the time on this show, and how we see the world, how we see ourselves in the world is so important to me, to a lot of the listeners who have really defined the path, that visualized path that they want to go on. What's the science behind mindset? And let's kind of talk a little bit deeper into that because I feel like that's a really interesting place to start. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm a big believer in the power of mindset. Um, so I think we can see our mindsets as these kind of um, <clears throat> kind of lenses through which we view the world and, um, you know, things that are happening to us and our ca capacity to deal with life's challenges. And there's a huge amount of research now showing that our mindsets can create self-fulfilling prophecies. Um, now that can, it can change things like our physiology, our perception, our behavior, our capacity to deal with failure, our motivation. So yeah, it's kind of influencing our capacity for success in life, however we define that. It all depends on our beliefs. Um, now, you know, kind of with my scientific hat on, like, I'm not saying that mindset is everything. Like we know that, you know, there are some, you know, limits to what mindset can do, but it really, I see it more as being like, um, by changing your mindset, you're kind of releasing the brakes on your potential. So if you have the right mindset, it could kind of accelerate your progress in whichever direction you want to go on. Um, if you have a negative mindset, it can, you know, hold you back. It makes everything a lot harder. You're putting in a lot of work, but you're not really achieving what you want. Yeah, it's so interesting to me because growing up, I definitely had a scarcity mindset. You know, I, I, we did not come from uh, a very uh, abundantly financially successful uh, environment, but we had enough. And but having enough, sometimes there's this mindset where, you know, I even going to college, I could be a teacher, I could be a, a cop, I could, you know, I had this very small world. And when I broke that down and started focusing from scarcity to, to abundance, I started seeing the world in such a different way, that mindset shift alone changed everything from what I thought I could do based on these limitations to curiosity, to asking questions I never would ask, to, to expanding and pushing past limits. And, um, you know, I, I'm just, it, it's one of those things that I'm sure you found that in the research and seeing that, that shift, what's your, what's your thoughts on the scarcity versus abundance, uh, topic there? Yeah. I mean, I think that's something I relate to personally because, um, like you, I didn't come from like a rich family. Uh, my dad was like a truck driver. My mom was, um, a stay at home mom. Um, no one in my university and sorry, no one in my family had been to university before I had. So, um, you know, like it could have been quite easy, I think, for me to arrive in Cambridge and to feel very out of place. Um, and we know from the research that, you know, that can have a really big impact. Like if you come from a working class background, um, you you can suffer from kind of stereotype threat. You can suffer from this additional anxiety that um, kind of clouds your thinking. It's like another element of strain that kind of kind of ma makes everything that you do a lot harder, which can then have an impact on your academic performance. Um, now, the the research shows us that we can overcome that uh, mindset by uh, by kind of reminding ourselves of all of the kind of 
values and characteristics that we have that kind of contribute to to the person that we are, kind of in addition to, say, our academic intelligence. So you perform this this activity called self-affirmation by kind of listing the 10 things that you think are most important about yourself or your life. So it could be your sense of humor, your kind of relationships. It could be, um, uh, you know, how kind you are, how compassionate you are, how musical you are. Um, and what you find is that actually by shifting that focus and realizing that you're kind of this whole being that's not just defined by your academic performance, um, that that can be very powerful in overcoming that stereotype threat. And so there have been some amazing studies on all kinds of minority groups within schools and universities. And they found that by regularly getting the students to perform this self-affirmation exercise to move from the kind of scarcity mindset into an abundance mindset, they dealt with the stresses of academic life a lot better. They kind of leveled up, like they started to perform as well as the kids who'd come from more privileged background um, backgrounds. Um, so that's just one example, I think, of how like a small psychological intervention that changes mindset can actually have a really big impact. Um, now, that doesn't mean that we should tell everyone who's um, kind of suffering from a lack of privilege, like, oh, it's all in your mindset. We don't need to make any uh, systemic changes to kind of the organizations that might be that might not be serving you as well as they could. But I think, you know, we need to change the kind of world around us. But I think in the meantime, it's also really useful to equip people with these skills, with these new mindsets to help to account, to help to buffer um, them from some of the stresses they might be facing. When you started, um, when you got to the university process and you started down learning, obviously, this has been a passion of yours, studying, learning, uh, you know, identifying theories and, and, and developing them with depth. Did you feel like you found your passion, like this was exactly where you were meant to be immediately? Or was it something that you had to build and develop? Yeah, it was something I had to build and develop. And um, so, uh, to be honest, yeah, I studied mathematics at university, which um, uh, kind of, so the UK university system is different from the US in that we specialise like very early on. Um, and I don't think that served me especially well, um, because I, um, at high school, I'd really enjoyed like um, creative writing, um, literature, studying foreign languages. And then like all of that was stripped away when I went to university. It was just like maths, like, you know, 16 hours a day. Um, and so, yeah, it took me a while actually to adjust to that from taking maths from being something that I, you know, did as a kind of package of activities that, you know, kind of fulfilled my intellectual curiosity to then being the sole thing that I focused on. Um you know, it was quite difficult. Um, but yeah, I found ways to kind of to make it more interesting. So that was when I started like, to kind of just fuel my curiosity, I started looking into the kind of lives of the kind of mathematicians had come up with these kind of theories that I was learning about, even though that wasn't really part of the uh, syllabus at all. It was just something that I found helped me to connect to the material better. And I guess that then like, served me well when I became a science writer, because you know, that's what you have to do when you're communicating science is to find ways to help people to connect to the material. And often the best way to do that is to tell a, a story, to create a narrative, to kind of let people know, you know, the inspiration behind an idea, the challenges that someone faces, and ultimately, you know, what that knowledge has contributed to human existence. Yeah, it's super interesting to me, because when you think about it, first of all, if I spent 16 hours a day doing math, I might as well be in prison at that point in time. I mean, I couldn't imagine. Um, but at the same time, what's interesting is by finding the storyline, you're simplifying the complex. What I find success to be so many times in careers is this simplification of a complex topic or issue. And if you can simplify something that's very complex and very deep, into a way that's that's bite-sized enough that we can execute upon it, that the actions can be taken. You know, that's that's got to be um, a really fun way to, uh, you know, it's, it's like explaining the math problem and then someone going, oh, I understand, versus just knowing that you're smart enough to understand it and the other person feeling like they're on the other side and they don't, they don't get anything. Yeah, that's exactly how I see 
you know, my role as a science writer is to kind of, to, you know, to enact that process. And, you know, I think it's like there's, <clears throat> the challenge is finding that narrative where you're still staying totally uh, kind of honest to the science, so it's totally accurate, but it's also relatable, understandable. Um, but, you know, it is possible to include the nuances within that kind of narrative that you're telling. Sometimes the nuances are, like, interesting um not necessarily tangents, but sometimes they're turning points in the story as well. And what I found over the years is that actually I can have faith in my readers that they will appreciate that, that they actually, they kind of have a sense when things are oversimplified um, and they respond better when you're actually acknowledging whether there's a bit of uncertainty. You know, a lot of my um, writing is about, you know, uh, kind of psychological interventions, like strategies that we can use and they actually, I think people like to know what are the boundary conditions, like when will this be helpful, when won't it be helpful? Um, so yeah, I think that's that's what I've been trying to do for the last 10 years is really strike that balance. Where did you, you've written three books and we'll, 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 uh, we'll dive deepest into the newest one that's coming out because I think connection's a great topic, but but just in, in writing those, those uh, major releases, where was there a moment in them where you're looking for the science and the science just absolutely surprises you? Like you're, you're, you, you went in thinking one thing and came out with a different result. And then you were forced to kind of continue to dive deeper and really prove it because you are aiming for factual evidence, not just hypothesis. Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, so, <clears throat> I mean, so before I kind of get my kind of, book contracts like I always do a very detailed proposal so if like the argument was kind of crumbling <laughs> uh, as I kind of delved into the research I would just scrap the idea with no obligation to continue but I think what um, the kind of biggest surprise for me when I was putting together the material for the expectation effect my second book which is all about mindset and um, self-fulfilling prophecies was actually just the abundance of research and how easily it kind of it naturally fell out without any kind of massaging on my part into the kind of separate chapters, 10 different chapters on kind of different mindsets that can influence different elements of your life from your kind of um, health and illness to uh, the effects of exercise, diet, even aging. Um, I just, it was like, the more I looked into the scientific literature, the more came back to me. And even when I was doing those kind of, um, uh, kind of robustness checks to be sure that the science stood up, um, stood up and, and was, uh, credible, you know, even when I was doing all of that, there was just so much to write about. So, I mean, that was a real pleasure. And it was the same with my third book, The Laws of Connection. It was, uh, kind of an embarrassment of riches almost. But the one chapter in The Expectation Effect that I you know, I kind of, I guess I was investigating it and was being very sceptical about the kind of conclusions that I first saw was this idea that our beliefs about aging can shape our longevity. So there was a huge study back in 2022 that showed that um, people who have a positive view of aging, who kind of associate aging with kind of wisdom, they, they think their life's going to get better as they get older, that they lived for seven and a half years longer than people who have a negative view of aging and That's I thought well awesome. that is interesting yeah I mean it is awesome it's almost like I just thought it's too good to be true like that I, I kind of struggled to see how that would kind of stand up but actually you know that study came out in 20 uh 2002 I then delved into this and like there was just so much research replicating that finding and then um, showing the kind of psychological and biological mechanisms behind it. Um, so, you know, I was just shocked, actually, by just how how strong that evidence was, which I think is that evidence is as strong as kind of any other lifestyle advice that we have. And, you know, concerning, say, the effects of diet on our longevity, you know, um, and I was super shocked by that. Um, but obviously super delighted as well, because I think actually you know, it's something that I live by now. Like I, it totally changed the way that I view ageism in our society. Um, the way I talk about aging, like I no longer make those kinds of jokes about, you know, my parents as they're getting older, because you don't want to reinforce the negative stereotypes of aging. Um, so that in particular was very revelatory for me. 
Yeah, it's super. It's 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 intriguing because um, first of all, men should be listening because if you can live an extra seven and a half years, it might be the only way you're catching your wife or your your partner in in your <laughs> life because she is yeah. uh, going to outlive you based on most research. And I know that's get tightening now, but um, at the same time, what's interesting to me is how how significant mindset is and how those lifestyle changes can impact so many things. So I'm thinking longer term. When I'm thinking longer term, I tend to be working towards a longer term result. And in doing so, I have to make shorter term decisions that lend myself to be more successful towards the long term vision. And so it's the simple approach of like, um, when you go to the gym, you're probably it's not about just going to the gym but your diet tends to get better if you have a consistent practice of going to the gym because you don't want to feel like garbage when you wake up in the morning like nothing's worse than having an extra drink or eating too much sugar and then getting up in the morning and then having to work out and feel how horrible that is and you do that a couple times and you go oh I'm going to change that and so I wonder how correlated those things are in your research where you know they they're interconnected because the one end the longer term thinking and approach allows you to make better short term decisions yeah so i mean i totally think that is one of the most important mechanisms that links kind of beliefs about aging to longevity is that if you are optimistic about kind of living a long and healthy life and you're focusing more on you know all the opportunities that kind of come with your retirement you are more likely to exercise to eat healthily you're because you want to kind of, you know, make the most of that golden period, basically. So no doubt that that is important. But then there's also this direct um, physiological link as well. And essentially, what it seems like is that if you, if you have this kind of negative view of aging, like you think you're going to become more vulnerable, like maybe you've hit like a milestone birthday, birthday, like 60 or 70. And suddenly you're like, I'm an old person inevitably I'm going to be start getting ill I'm going to be frail I might fall over and injure myself I'm going to be forgetful um that mindset is creating a lot of stress in your life because like all the things you used to do and enjoy like meeting friends just simple daily chores like going to the shops suddenly become this kind of much bigger uh challenge to you they're kind of like a threat to your to your well-being and so that's what we see that the people with the negative views of aging kind of after midlife like 60 plus their levels of cortisol this stress hormone steadily increase as they get older so it's a chronic stress um and we know that chronic stress like when it's day after day after day you're just feeling kind of more and more threatened by your environment we know that that's bad for your health um we know that's also linked to inflammation and sure enough you see that levels of inflammation within the body rise accordingly for these people with the negative views of aging and inflammation uh can then cause bodily damage um and we can see this you know it's a risk factor for loads of different diseases so things like alzheimer's disease cardiovascular disease um and we can see these changes right down to kind of the gene expression within individual cells so each cell has a kind of characteristic pattern of gene activity that tends to change as we get older um it's a kind of you can call it an epigenetic clock and what you see is that for the people with the negative view of aging compared to the people with the positive view of aging, that clock is ticking at a faster rate. Um, and so this is why I'm so convinced by all of this evidence, because it's multiple strands. And that's what I always look for in my science writing is, you know, I would never base um, an article, let alone a book on like one finding. But when you have so many different uh, lines of research that are all converging on the same conclusion, then I think you have to take it seriously. We talk a lot about the why here and and something bigger than ourselves. And when you talk about connection, you know, for me, when I think of longevity, I don't think about myself. The only part I think about for myself is I think I want to live healthy and uh, I want to move. I want to be more agile. I want to, you know, I do things at 45 that I didn't focus on at 35 simple things like uh, deep squats and movement exercises so that I can maintain balance and, you know, because I want to live healthy into the future. But the why behind that, that, um, that drive 
is really, I want to see my sons get married and have children. And I want to be a great grandfather and I want to be able to actually do things with them. And uh, my grandfather passed away at 95 years old and I did the eulogy and I stood out on that altar and I saw all of the family that he created. And, um, you know, not from a selfish space, but just from a beautiful, you know, uh, creative space of what's the greatest legacy that we can live is to not only have been a part of their life, but to also continue to have been a part of each of their lives as they grow through the things that you've been through. And so I, I'm, I'm interested in, in any correlation or anything that you found um, in the research that suggests the why and the, 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 the connection between connecting to others and a bigger why than yourself. Yeah, I mean, so there's a lot of research on this. Um, so I'd say, you know, it can go in lots of different directions. Like there can be lots of different kind of whys that people have that's associated with longer life. Um, so just having a sense of purpose um, is incredibly useful. And, you know, that can be very individual. Like, you know, for some people it might, their purpose might be the kind of career that they're creating or artistic achievement. You know, that's valid. Um, it could be helping others through volunteering. We know that volunteers, people who um, kind of work hard for something that they feel passionate about for this kind of bigger cause, they live longer. Um, you know, part of that is because they have this kind of extra meaning in their life. And we know that that's one of the reasons probably why people who are religious um, live longer as well. Um, religion often comes hand in hand with kind of healthier behaviors because um you know like a temperance is kind of encouraged by most yeah. uh discipline religions. it's but discipline in general discipline right? exactly yeah you know that's important but you know it seems that kind of a sense of meaning is also uh super important but then finally yeah like a sense of connection which incidentally comes from volunteering or religion um and in its own right having a a solid group of uh of friends, relatives, even weak ties, but people that you see regularly, who you feel give you the support that you need, that independently of all of the other factors um, can predict longevity. And so that's really something, you know, that <clears throat> is a, a bit like the research on um, having positive beliefs about aging. Like the more I've looked into this, the more convinced I am that, you know, it's so fundamental to good health, um, social connection. You know, there are huge meta-analyses. So when scientists gather, like, all the available evidence from hundreds of studies, um, you know, and look at kind of how uh, how well replicated the individual effects have been, like, they all point in this direction that social connection is a fundamental factor for, a factor for our health. And that actually, if you look at the effect sizes of those studies, it's kind of equal or greater than so many of the lifestyle factors that we know are good for our health. So diet, exercise, how much you drink, whether you smoke, um, you know, whether you're kind of vaccinated, whether you kind of control your blood pressure with medication, you know, social connection is as or more important than all of these. Um, so yeah, it's, um, having people that we love you know is important for a happy life but also for a healthy life yeah it's i think it's very powerful we do a sunday dinner every single week mm -hmm. at my parents house and our our kids come uh some of the uh the great grandchildren are there now the next generation and we all look forward to it every week and if i'm looking forward to it in the busy full of connection life that I live, I can only imagine at how much my father's looking forward to it when he's retired and has much less interaction than I do in a day. And so, um, you know, these are things though, that really drive us and, and create that, that bigger purpose. And then when you talk about religion, you know, I think about, about going to mass on a Sunday or a, or a Saturday night, oftentimes Saturday night, and um, it's interesting because my kids will comment and they're like, dad, everybody here is so much older than the Sunday masses. It's all younger. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, but this is a community. This is a Saturday night. So this is their Saturday night. They're coming here. Mm. They're hanging out afterwards. They're grabbing dinner with somebody. 
This is a part of the community and it gives them something bigger than themselves beyond God, something that allows them to have a, be a part of a bigger community, which allows them to feel alive, which I think is a really great point. And I'm glad the science helps that because it only uh, further makes it more valuable. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, people might find that um, in lots of different ways. You know, it could be like a passion for music and going to like a concert. A concert. Or it could be going to like an art exhibition. Um, you know, uh, it could be taking part in sports with the, you know, people that really matter to you. You know, all of these things um, give us that kind of broader sense of purpose and help us to connect. Yeah. It, when when um, When you look at the the connection and the social uh, part and you, and you compare it to diet and the other things that you're, you're mentioning, it is really interesting how powerful that is. And in today's world where our phones are how people feel more connected and they're actually less connected, it's interesting to think of what that could do to longevity because there is a disconnection um, in, in the, in, in communities today where even looking at children, I mean, the, the amount of time that the teenagers that, and I have two, um, and their friends, they will sit on their phones everywhere we go and they still interact. They play sports together. They do things together. And I think that our boys are doing it a little bit better than, than, uh, most because I'm pressing them constantly to put it down. But I worry a little bit about the connectivity of, of where we're heading where we feel this this false sense of security of connection, um, but I don't know if you have any research to support that that's real or if that's just a concern that's that's not validated. So I think the evidence is kind of complicated, um, but so yeah, it's something that I did look into for the laws of connection, and so I would say you know the, it seems that face to face uh, contact with someone is you know. You have, there's elements of that, including like the physical presence, touch, that can't, you know, having, being part of it, the exactly the same environment where your kind of focus of attention can be on the same things. Like that is really important for your overall sense of connection with that person. Um, but I think sometimes we're so hung up on that, that actually we forget that even remote conversations over the phone or even text texting someone sending an sms or emails can still be meaningful and are useful so i think if you're using um your phones for to connect with people in that way to actually have some kind of dialogue where you're um sharing your inner lives your thoughts and feelings and passions with someone else um you know, I, I think that's a good thing still and you know when we live in this world where sometimes we're not physically present we're not able to be physically present with the people that matter to us because we live in another country another state or you know different time zone you know that's still really important and actually what the research suggests is that we sometimes we're so hung up on the idea that it's not good enough that we just don't bother with that remote communication at all and then we're missing out if we it's better than nothing basically far better than nothing but I do think there's a problem if we're using our phones to engage in social comparison. So you're not actually sharing anything meaningful with other people, but you feel in competition with them. You know, you're you're looking at other people's Instagram posts and feeling kind of envious of their lives and feeling resentful. You're creating posts that maybe aren't totally honest to how you're feeling to try to kind of, uh, you know, keep up better. with the Joneses. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um you know, I don't think there's much evidence to suggest that that, that is um, a good form of uh, communication at all for our mental health or our physical health. Um, so I think more mindful use of technology is kind of what I aim for in my personal life and to make sure that when I can, I still have the physical contact. But when I can't, I use the um, remote contact in the, the way that's going to create the most meaningful connection possible. That's good. That's it's good. Uh, it's good to hear uh, where science backs certain things, and also to remember that there is a great connection uh, to just just the old AT and T. Reach out and touch somebody. You know, having that right. yeah. FaceTime call or that quick text. 
I do a voice text all the time where I just leave voice text messages to people because it's a great way to, um, to send somebody a quick message that you're thinking about them or you saw something successful instead of commenting on Instagram, how awesome it is that your son graduated from high school. I might leave a message that says, Hey, I saw that your son was graduating. You know, I've always admired you as a father and super excited for this next chapter for your kids. I also know how hard it is because I'm approaching it as well. And, um, yeah. you know, just a connection call is, is what I kind of call that. And, um, and I feel like that matters more. Like I don't ever put happy birthday on Facebook or Instagram because if you're in my inner circle, I'm, I'm calling you, I'm texting you, I'm joking on you. Like I'm doing something <laughs> that's going to be a part versus just blanketing the, I, I'm, I'm grateful for the people that do it to me. Um, but I've, I've never really loved it in the sense that I like to actually have a deeper connection. I like, I don't like to focus as much on width. I like to focus more on depth. And yeah. um, so it's, it's just interesting to me. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And so um, I do have some friends who they'll be like, they'll send a text that'll just be like, hi, just wanted to let you know I'm thinking of you. Um, I'm like, okay, that's nice. <laughs> um, I haven't heard from you in two years. <laughs> like, if and then if I reply to ask for more, you know, to ask like, how are you doing? Like, you know, what's going on in your life? And you don't get a reply, then you're like, well, that feels more like, paying lip that, service to this that idea about them. that than... was about them <laughs> right <laughs> mark off yeah. the narcissistic <laughs> friends you know exactly who they are very quickly right right exactly so i think and this is something that i try to emphasize in the laws of connection is that like um you know so i kind of outline these 13 laws you know one of them is to try to connect with your um you know people who are kind of not present in your life but to kind of to let them know that they're in your thoughts and feelings and to kind of maintain that connection rather than shying away, which we often do because we it feels a bit awkward sometimes reaching out to someone who you haven't been in regular contact with. Um, but like I try to emphasize in the book that it's like this isn't like an algorithm. It's not just like you cut and paste a message and send it out to like a hundred people and that is your job done. Like, you know, it has to be meaningful. And so yeah, a bit of thought, a bit of feeling has to go into that in the way that you described, like, you know, talking about what you share with the other person, talking about how you feel about what they've told you, you know, about their um, son's graduation, um, or whatever event it is that you've noticed on Facebook, you know, that's the kind of connection that we need to be going towards. Uh, it's not just about kind of um, playing the numbers game or whatever. Yeah, I've always felt that social media is an enhancer. So it's not a detractor, it's an enhancer. And what I mean by that is, you know, one of my best friends from college lives, you know, uh, 12 hours away. And at the end of the day, it's been great to watch his family grow. It's been great to see my cousin's families grow when they don't live close because there's a connection that I still feel when I visit. It's almost like I know where they're at in their life. I know that she just had her first communion or um, their, their prom just happened and it allows you to have an enhanced relationship, but you have to keep the foundation there. You can't just yeah. use that as the only way to connect or it can be rather empty. Yeah, that's exactly it. I think it's, you know, is the, like the difference between like junk food and like a nutritious meal. Um, it takes time to create a nutritious meal, but then it's worth it for all of the benefits that you get, like how tasty it is and, how healthy it is for you and it's the same with social connection um i just think yeah when applying all of these laws that i mentioned like we have to be mindful we have to actually make sure that there's some depth to what we're doing yeah when when you um when you do these these uh these books and you research incessantly and you and you lay out uh such great information um what have been some of the biggest changes you've made in your own life based on your your writing? Yeah, I mean, so that's kind of one of the principles of my writing is that like I, um, you know, starting with my first book, but then especially with my second and third books, I don't really include anything that I don't practice myself. So it has to be that I've read the scientific research, it's been well replicated. Um, 
and then it has to be something that I've personally found practical and useful to do. Um, so, you know, anything that I include in my books, like I have tested and, you know, it has changed my life in some way. Uh, but there are definitely some examples that um, kind of really stick out for me. And so say with my, um, this kind of forthcoming book, um, you know, uh, I'm quite a shy person. Um, I kind of was as a teenager much shyer. Um, I kind of got over that kind of as I embarked on my scientific uh, kind of journalistic career. Um, But what I wasn't so good at, I think, is uh, talking to strangers still. uh, You know, like talking to someone in the queue, uh, in the line at Starbucks or, you know, next to you on the subway. Um, Or, and then kind of, capitalizing on a sense of connection that you you feel with someone that rapport so there's this phenomenon called the liking gap in social psychology and that is when you meet someone for the first time you have like a great conversation you feel like you've really hit it off like you you really like and respect the other person you think they're kind of so funny so smart um you know so kind and then you go away and you're like well I really liked them, but they probably don't like me as much as I liked them. Um, Now, what the research shows is that is a very common feeling to the extent that probably the other person that you were speaking to was thinking exactly the same thing. So each of you has gone away thinking that the other person um, didn't like you as much as you liked them. Um, That's why it's the liking gap. Um, And I just found that this uh, discovery was just like uh, transformative for me because in the past, I, you know, I kind of suffered the liking up so much that like, you know, I'd turn down like party invitations from like colleagues I kind of vaguely knew at work or even people I worked quite closely with because I'd just be like, they're asking me, they must be asking me out of politeness. And it will be super awkward if I turn up because they won't, because, uh, you know, they don't really want me there. And like, reading about the liking gap and realizing how common this is I just and then looking at my reasoning I think that is just so absurd like no one not many people are like that bothered about your feelings that that they're going to invite you to a party if they actually don't want you to come like it's just not that's a very rare thing to happen and so you know just finding that made me think actually you know I need to be more confident with other people and I need to given that the other person is probably feeling something like the liking gap as well What I really want to do is to make sure that they go away from the conversation without that anxiety. So now I just, if I I only say if it's true, but, you know, often it is true. I'll tell people, like, at the end of the conversational meeting, you know, like, I really enjoyed that. I found you really interesting. Like, I'd love to do that again. Like, just, like, saying the kind of unspoken bit out loud um, has just worked, like, wonders for me. And I just feel so much more socially confident now like I just think it's kind of eased over those anxieties so much that's why it's kind of been so important for me it's interesting how um your greatest strengths turned up too loud become your blind spots and your ability Mm. to analyze and think is something that makes you special but when you do it too often it puts you in a place where you're actually over analyzing a situation where I'm the exact opposite is that I'm going to wear everything out on my sleeve. I'm going to meet someone in the Starbucks line, overshare, over be involved. And I walk away most of the time knowing that the energy matched and I feel really good. And if I saw them again, I think it would be great. Or I might see the same person in line a couple of days in a row and I strike up the conversation. And very rarely do I walk away feeling that liking gap. What I might feel is that I might be too open because my energy is very open. And so um, I, as I got older, I just tried to really reciprocate the energy that someone's giving me. And if you were closed and and introverted, I wouldn't, I would, in the old days, I would receive that as, as a lack of interest, as a, as a disconnection. Maybe I would look at your bio and I would say, gosh, this guy's so much smarter than I am. <laughs> um, you know, what is he going to want to talk to me about, right? And what you learn is those blind spots with our strengths turned up too loud. When we match with people that are different, that are unique in different ways, it's, it's even more fun to have conversations. Like it's, I watch my sons, you know, one of them is super extroverted and the other is a little more introverted. 
And I look at the power they get from each other in different ways. The, the, the severe discipline my more introverted son has is very admirable, but, but my oldest son can go and see him. He lives, they live apart um, because one plays for a soccer academy. So I told you my big soccer love. And, uh, but they, but my son has lived in a new house for like all year. My oldest son goes to see him for like one weekend and meets like five friends that have been next door to my other son the entire time. And now my youngest son is like, wow, that's great. Like we find this beauty in it, in, in the differences. Um, and the last thing I'll say, just one other point is Jim Quick, who wrote the book Limitless, um, says, I saw him speaking and I actually uh, saw him later at a party that we went to after the, the speaking engagement. But he said that introverts start their day with a certain number of chips and every interaction is one chip less that they have for later in the day. And so if you're if you're um, if you start with five chips, if I've had five interactions before 10 a.m., you could be done. You're, you're not really, you're not getting recharged from that. You're drained. And he said, extroverts start every day with zero chips and they build and they build and each interaction provides them a new chip until they crash. <laughs> and a lot of, yeah. and, that, and, and that's really been my life is I, I add, I add, I add, and then I'm like, okay, I'm done. I can't do any more. And um, so I saw Jim at a party that night uh, with some friends and it was a lively group of people, all entrepreneurs, super fun. And, uh, and I, I commented, I was like, I really enjoyed the presentation. And, and, and I said, I love the chip part. I'm going to use it the rest of my career, my life. <laughs> and he said, I am out of chips. I am struggling to even be here right now. And it was great to yeah. your point. Like you said, you share some of the things that you wouldn't normally share. It was a nice moment where I was like, I get it, man, go enjoy the rest of your evening. And I won't suck any more of the energy out of your life right now. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think we kind of have to be kind of aware of our limits and, uh, you know, like introversion, extroversion, you know, they're definitely like real psychological constructs that um, do influence our social behavior. But another thing that surprised me from the research I did was that maybe the influence isn't quite as strong as we assume. So what you find with introverts actually is that they, <clears throat> I'm sure, you know, it is true that they, uh, you know, find social uh, social engagements kind of tiring they're not getting the same amount of energy as an extrovert but they do tend to overestimate how tiring they're going to find it and they they are much more likely to have the negative expectations about you know what those interactions are going to involve like how awkward they're going to be like what well, you know they you know they're more concerned about like you know whether they'll kind of find the right words to say um whether they'll find the other person interesting, all of that. Um, but the reality is often much better than they think. So if if you're an introvert and you want to try out being more gregarious, um, you know, if you put yourself up to that test and try like for one night to be a bit more like of a party animal, um, you might find that you enjoy it a lot more than you expect. And regular practice can help to shift someone's kind of behavior. So I think it's I don't think we should be telling like introverts to become more extroverted or vice versa, but we are flexible people. And actually we can shift the dial slightly if that's what we think would give us more kind of meaning and value in our lives. If we feel frustrated by the kind of by our current personality. Um, so I found that like a very encouraging It's the same with shyness, which is slightly different from introversion. You know, if you have a growth mindset about your shyness, if you believe that it is possible to kind of overcome those anxieties, well, that can become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, and the important thing with all of this is to treat ourselves with self-compassion. So, you know, um, we we kind of, I think our culture has encouraged us to think like we have to uh, hold ourselves up to high standards and, you know, self-flagellate if we kind of make a mistake, if we say a faux pas, you know, if things don't go according to plan. Um, but the research shows, oh, because we think that by punishing ourselves, we're going to not make the same mistake again. Um, the research shows actually, you know, that's uh, that's really not the reality. Like self-criticism in general makes it much harder for you to enact behavioural change. 
uh, because it's kind of causing so much stress that actually it's much, it's just, you don't have the resources to kind of, uh, to learn from uh, the event. Whereas if you treat yourself with self-compassion, um, you have much more mental resources at your, um, uh, at your fingertips to be able to kind of live the life that you want to lead, to kind of adapt your behavior according to the demands of the situations. Yeah, and, and from the extroversion standpoint, with the growth mindset, what I've found through through failure and learning over the years is that um, there's a lot of value in sitting back and watching what's going on. You know, sometimes you go right in and you don't, you're not as present as you could be, or you're talking more than you're listening, which means you're not building better relationships. And so, you know, these are things that the extrovert has to learn that are a growth mindset because of some of the things that, you know, are almost a defense mechanism. Their defense mechanism to shyness yeah. might be just to talk more, to create new relationships, yeah. to feel like they're the party the animal in the group that we were talking about. And so as I've gotten older, um, I definitely enjoy the energy in a party and I could definitely get, you know, uh, I can get to have, have a great time very quickly, but I, I genuinely enjoy listening, taking an introspective view, being being more curious um, and sharing a little less, learning a little bit more. And those are things that it took time to do. And a lot of it was just establishing my own defense mechanisms to how I felt comfortable in a room. So, you know, it goes both yeah. ways. Oh, yeah, it totally does. So actually, that was the other thing I learned from researching this book was uh you know however gregarious and sociable you kind of think you are now like there's there are going to be some ways that you can improve um so like you said like extroverts often aren't perceived as being especially good listeners actually introverts outperform extroverts there because they're not giving the right cues to show that they're really listening um i don't think there's evidence to show that extroverts actually objectively aren't as good at listening but they're not giving the right. cues that people sometimes want um you know, it could be that you're not effective at kind of complimenting people or expressing your gratitude because like how we phrase um, uh, this appreciation of someone else, it really matters. So uh, if you're expressing gratitude and it's still all about me, so it's like, um, oh, thanks so much for kind of giving me a lift. That saved me a lot of time. <laughs> I, I actually think, you know, I'm sure I've done that. Like it's a very natural thing to say, um, but that's not, great at connecting compared to if you say like thanks for giving me the lift you are always there for me like when I need you you're so generous to have driven me all that way even though I know it's inconvenient for you so you're turning the kind of spotlight onto the other person um so it's little things like that that I discovered that you know we can all do to change the way we connect you know irrespective of whether we are introverted or extroverted yeah, I, I often um, in performance reviews with employees or conversations with friends, I refer to a lot of that as turning the I into we and seeing it as as something that is bigger than just me. Um, and, and using the word you is one of the most powerful marketing tools that ever existed because people need to see themselves in it, not yourself. And so... Um, it's super, it, it really is interesting. And so your, your book comes out in uh, June 4th in the US, June 6th in the UK. How, is, how exciting is the process? Are you, are, you, are you in the uncomfortable phase where you're kind of like waiting to see how things go? Or are you in the, I'm just putting my head down and working my tail off to make sure people know that this is going to be worth reading? Uh, it's kind of a little bit of everything. Um, so, yeah, I am working hard, like, um, you know, writing articles for promotion, um, uh, you know, doing all of these interviews, which is actually like so exciting for me. So it's one of the best things about publishing a book is that you spent like, you know, I've been thinking about this idea now for about three years in total. Um, a lot of that is work that I did basically, you know, on my own in libraries or kind of at my desk. Um you know, then there were the edits, you know, all of the kind of preparing it for publication. And now it's like, I can finally talk to people about it. I can get the message out there. Um, I can get feedback. I can hear like what people respond to, um, what questions they have, you know, so that is what um, 
it's like the kind of peak of the experience of being an author is to kind of actually see your book out there getting um getting readers getting attention kind of um triggering conversations what is your timeline before you start the next project so you know when when you do this and you have the 90 days after that you just have to press to make sure that everybody knows what it is um there are authors out there that have figured out that that you have this cycle and if you're not reproducing a new book it's challenging just to have that relevance but you produce depth in your books you produce research you it takes you time what's the timeline of your projects on an average basis yeah so i mean my books come out kind of rough, roughly every three years so i'd say it's like one year for kind of planning kind of you know i already have a vague idea for my next one but like i have to put a lot of research into that to make sure that it stands up before i even kind of present that to my publishers so about a year i'd say um then you know that's already good background if it does come off the idea then that's like great preparation for the writing process which takes about a year and then the kind of editing uh dealing with the edits proofreading preparing for publication is basically another year so yeah it's very much a cycle um uh yeah i probably won't start kind of working in earnest on the next one like you said for about 90 days after publication um so i might be reading around the topic but i won't really start looking in depth until the publicity for this one has slowed down a little bit do you have a favorite is there some do, do you feel like the next project like this is the best work that you've done and so when you come out with it you you put everything into it at that moment and this is i mean the the book presentation the cover everything about the way you've presented this is beautiful. So um, just oh, from you. just from looking at it, you know, I looked at all the I went on, I went on and, and pr I pre ordered the book because you can pre order it right now on Amazon and anywhere else that that I'm sure is uh, for sale, but it really has a great presentation. And I, I'm always attracted to connection. I mean, that's something that that I really love learning about. And so it's interesting to me just to see how others um, formulate opinions and challenges and opportunities to learn to be a better connector yeah no thank you so much because i'm really glad that you think that it's always like deciding on the title the cover like all of these kind of um aesthetic qualities can be quite um uh quite a daunting prospect because you don't want to kind of you know you put all this work into actually like crafting the book and then you don't want it to kind of fall down at that last hurdle so i'm super pleased you like the uh presentation but yeah i think like to go back to your um question i do think it's can be a bit of a bittersweet process kind of that transition from going from your last book because i was still kind of promoting the last book with like uh podcast and stuff until quite recently and then kind of having to lay that to one side and it's almost like saying like you're out in the world now like <laughs> you know good luck but I'm not going to be there to kind of push you any further like it has to stand on its own two feet now and then moving on to the next one um you know it's a mixture of kind of a little bit of sadness leaving the last one behind excitement with the new one um yeah you know and I guess I think I've learned as a writer like a lot from each book so I hope that each my kind of style of uh, of presenting this research and formulating my argument and providing um, useful, interesting, engaging information for people that they can use to uh, to put to practice in their lives. I hope that's improved with each book. So I guess, yeah, the last one is my favorite in that respect. I'm sure it does. It's interesting because if you look at authors, especially when you're doing science-based um you know, writings and you're, you're developing uh, an idea and really helping to prove it, share it. Um, it's going to get better every time. But when I think of art in general, like music, my favorite bands, I love their first albums, you know, usually 10 times better than the things that, or they might have like one, two or three, and then it starts to become more of the same. And so I don't feel like authors are often like that. I feel like so many times with writing, it does get better every time and the quality gets better. Um, you know, I, I wrote one book and I could tell you right now I would do 27 things different the next time and I want it to be better. I don't ever want to read that and go, this was my best work. I want to develop a strategy 
to be better each time. Yeah, that's exactly how I feel. Like I love being on a trajectory and you don't want to like rest on your laurels. Um, Like it, it is again, it's like having the growth mindset, like recognizing that there are always things that you can learn and improve. Um, So yeah, that's why, you know, that's partly why I moved on from like uh, kind of journalism, like writing for like the BBC and uh, the garden, uh, the guardian, the Atlantic, like magazines like that is that, you know, I still love journalism. I still love doing that, but I really wanted the big kind of creative challenge of writing a book. You know, how do you sustain someone's attention over 300 pages, like, you know, citing like 400 academic articles. How do you make that digestible and entertaining and interesting? Um, And I just love that challenge right from the start. But like, I still think, you know, there's always ways that you can learn how to do it better, Uh, like new tricks you can use, new, uh, new ways of structuring, new ways of like illustrating your the points that you want to make. Um, and that's why I love the process so much. And it's why I want to do another one is because I still feel like um, there's more to learn. Well, David Robson, if you uh, want to find him, I suggest you Google his name, go to his website. He also, you've written so many amazing articles. I read uh, several in the last couple of days, just, um, you know, alcohol uh, uh, research on on early development of, of teenagers and college age and just different things that are so interesting to have the science-based writing. So um, I encourage you to not only read his three great books, but also um, to read what else has been published because there's some great articles in The Atlantic and The Guardian and some of these other publications, the BBC. Your awards are are well-deserved. I've enjoyed having a great conversation with you. I've loved learning from you. And I look forward to getting my copy of The Laws of Connection, The Scientific Secrets, of building a strong social network. Soon to come out in just a couple of weeks. David, thanks for joining me today. Thank you so much, Scott. Um, It's been a real pleasure. I loved your questions. I loved the conversation. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. If you liked it, there's more where this one came from. Click here and enjoy some more.